It's me, Brandon. You're off there for the evening. I am signing copies of The Well of Ascension today. Let us know in the chat if indeed we are live. Um, apologize for last week. I had to actually do movie meetings, which you guys are all excited that I'm doing. So you're probably happy uh, to have me doing that. Um, um, so uh, I normally we will be doing the first Thursday, I think, right, Adam? Normally, but, yes. Um, but I have to make uh, call Adam and be like, uh, change this. We've got some people in town that I need to meet with. So live, but the audio is kind of weird. Audio is kind of weird. Ooh. Hmm. Mm. Stuff audio. So, one second, I'm going to turn the sound off.
Well, we might be live again. Um, Adam changed microphones and did some wizardry. He warned me to say that uh, it might be a little loud on your guys' end. We apologize for that. Let us know how things are with this. Uh, no longer using the microphone that is hovering in front of me. No, you are. Oh, I am? Yeah. Okay. We're just, I just running it. receivers. Okay. We are running it through a different receiver. So. You got it. Lots of yays. Lots okay. of yays. All right. Um, so, hey, welcome. I am signing the Well of Ascension leather bounds right now. Uh, this is uh, the last batch of them that I'll move on to Hero of Ages, and um, I will sign a bunch of those. So we are kind of gated on uh, leather bound releases based on how often I am able to sit here and sign my name. But thank you guys for showing up tonight. Uh, to keep me company as I do the um, mind-numbingly boring job of writing my name 2,000 <laughs> times. Uh, Kara tells me you usually get around 1,500 to 1,800, so not quite 2,000 times a night. But, um, but yeah. Rookie, rookie numbers, Brandon. You rookie numbers, I know. I know. I don't know how, um, like, I know... One of the more famous stories that I was told by one of my publicists when, when I was out was when she was with Ozzy Osbourne on tour uh, for his book. Um, and Ozzy had 8,000 people show up for his book signing. And he got through all 8,000 people. And I said, how on earth? Because, like, I've my biggest signing ever was around 4,000, we think, the, uh, the Oathbringer launch. And I was there till 5 a.m., right? Uh, signed seven hours straight, and I think we probably got through only about a thousand or fifteen hundred of you. And uh, they said, "Oh, well, Ozzy sat with his head down like this, mumbling the whole time in a stream of consciousness mumble that was constant and nonstop. And people just put things in front of them, and he signed them. And he didn't look up, um, and he just kept going. And and we aren't sure if he thought he was." what he thought he was doing or where he thought he was, but um, all the fans loved it because that's what they expect from Ozzy. So, um, but yeah, he got through 8,000 in that book signing. So it is rookie numbers for me to only be able to get 1,500 of these when, you know, Ozzy Osbourne, he can, he can do 8,000, no problem. Well, and I know uh, John Green mm -hmm. uh, did a whole bunch on his oh, uh, yeah? YouTube as well. Like, were his books or were they? Um, his were uh, tip and sheets. Tip and sheets. He sheets. He did a hundred thousand. There was some obscene number. I don't. Oh remember my exactly goodness! How many, but there was. How on earth would he Let me manage that? That is insane. Uh, was it one session or was I don't it like so. across months or like we could do that if we had fifty days in a row? Two hundred thousand. Okay. So, wow. wow. That's insane. And that was from 2017, so How probably Fault in Our Stars that? or something like that. I don't know. Maybe maybe they had, like, the team that was constantly moving, because I have to move my own pages. Uh, you know, I'm very, very bootstrappy about this. Uh, I, uh, I, you know, very blue collar of me to be moving my own pages as I sign um, <laughs> my expensive leather-bound editions of the book. So maybe um, I did once go sign at the Random House Warehouse, um, and they had like an assembly line of people. So they had boxes and boxes of books and they had one person who would just be slicing open the boxes of books and like turning them over and putting the books um, in a stack. And then another person who would take stacks and put them on the table and another person who would open them to the proper page, another person who hold, held them open and then they just move in front of me like a conveyor belt m made of people moving books and then another one on the other side that shovel checked and then another one that took them and put them in the box and another person who then taped up the box and put it back in the stack and so there were like 10 people here helping me sign books uh for several hours so uh yeah from the chat michael buchwald says the entire first printing of the fault in our stars was signed man that's that is insane, is insane. yeah and the fact that the first printing was 200,000 copies, apparently, that's it also insane, it, yeah. right? Like, that's, uh, that's some YouTube power right there. Um, and, you know, very good book. But also, uh, for the first printing of, of that to be so huge, yeah. 
Well, here we are. Uh, you will only have me for two hours, and I will not be signing 200,000 copies of things. Um, I, indeed, will be signing far fewer than 200,000 copies. Maybe in the future, we can try an assembly line thing and, you know, make, uh, make the team have to be moving these in front of me super fast. Yeah, I don't mind watching them do that. <laughs> that, that might be... Uh, that might be something amusing oh, really to try. Really only Hazel. As long as Hazel has to run a lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hazel and Kathy. Mm. No, no, he'd rather Kathy just not be in here. Right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's, true. That, that's I didn't know that was an option. <laughs> she's not here right now. She's, uh, she's, I think, at my place. Um, she's probably in the yeah. chat, though. She's, yeah, that is true. That is true. Um, so, uh, we're going to do Q&A. Um, what we are thinking, you guys can uh, sound off on this, what you think of this. Oh yeah, someone's gotta come get these, right? Um, is that what we're, the way we're doing this? Um, so Especially somebody come and collect them and then I will get the new stack. So, um, just, yeah. Uh, Mr. Unknown says, new mm -hmm. hair, question mark? I think it's the same hair, it just it, looks uh, like Well, it does kind of, um, I'll just let you grab that. Uh, so I was just with my stylist, Patrick, uh, who uh, does watch these, by the way. So he will love seeing you guys' uh, compliments of the hair. Uh, yes, um, just got back uh, from the haircut. As my Thursdays are pretty interesting. Um, <laughs> like, I spend all Thursday either on phone calls or being driven places while I'm on phone calls. And so uh, Adam got the wonderful privilege today of driving me to the haircut place, which is about a half hour away, while I was on one phone call and then driving me home while I was on a different phone call. Uh, we try to stack all of the non-writing stuff, as pos uh, if possible, stack it all on Thursday so that I can spend Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday writing stories. And so, yeah. So today was haircut day and uh, Patrick cut my hair. And um, and we decided to, to go back to the part down the middle, which I used to do when I was younger. And we'll do that for a little while and see. I don't know. I, I have, you know, I have never had a really great hairstyle. You know, it's never been a thing that I've been able to figure out a great hairstyle that matches uh, how much effort I want to put into it versus what it looks like on me. So, well, we'll see what we think of this one. Uh, the, the parted to one side was an Emily choice a number of years ago. And so um, I'm going to go back to the parted down the middle. Um, Boreal from the YouTube chat wants to know if you uh, watched the trailer for The Green Knight. So I saw it come up on my things and I was deep in a writing mood at the time and I did not get to it. Uh, I actually saw it and thought, ah, I miss going to movies because I would see all the good trailers. I would put, intentionally not watch trailers until I went to the cinema to see the trailer in its full glory, unless it's a show movie I knew I was going to see, whereupon I wouldn't watch the trailer. Um, like I managed to avoid the trailer to The Matrix um, until oh, wow. after I'd seen the film, which was wow. which was really hard to do. Um, but I knew I was going to enjoy that film, so. Um, I haven't been able to do that with a lot of things, but um, I avoided, for instance, um, there's another one. I didn't avoid the Lord of the Rings trailers because there's nothing to spoil, but um, yeah. Uh, so I haven't seen it yet, um, but uh, there's a lot of excitement around it. So um, It looks beautiful. Yeah. So I am, uh, I am excited to perhaps see it when my theater is done, maybe. Maybe that's when we'll watch it. I don't know. I'm curious. I don't know if this is a... A theatrical release only if they're going to be streaming it oh yeah where is it what what is it's I, middle summer i, I yeah. don't know exactly what their plan is yeah 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 which studio is making it oh. do we know i'm sure someone in the chat knows um uh line entertainment hmm yeah don't know who that is uh, Braun uh. studio sailor bear huh lots of uh lots of production studios that i'm not familiar with so that's cool oh and it's jim actually mm -hmm. so Oh, well, distributed by A24. They're a bigger uh -huh, yeah. uh, distribu distributor, okay. actually. Okay, interesting. Still, that's, uh, that's uh, yeah. I assume everyone, the, the, the buzz seemed good around the trailer, even though I hadn't seen it. So uh, I will I will make sure to watch it. I am, I'm excited for movies to be coming out again. 
I really like the cinema as an art form, right? I like I like films generally more than I like television. We've talked about that before on the stream, and so I'm I'm excited. I I did watch the the big hey the MCU still going. Uh, here's all the billion things we're gonna release in rapid succession because we had them all in the pipeline and we waited now for uh for a year and a half to release them all. Uh, congratulations, here you go. Um, and that was really fun, hearing Stanley and stuff. The people who put that trailer together, um, just less a trailer and more, I don't know. They did a good job with that. I, I was impressed by the filmmaking of just the marketing piece of promotional material there. Uh, should we jump into some questions? Let's do it. Uh, so friend of the program, Brian mm. T. Hill. Oh, hey, Brian. Uh, he says... Beta reader and friend <laughs> yes. of the program. And the person who got me my... A uh, copy of Microsoft Word that I used for years and years and years. Um, Is was, he still with Microsoft? I don't think he's with Microsoft anymore, but he did work for Microsoft and got me a copy um, a, a from like the company store or something. I had it for years. Uh, anyway, Brian says, is imagination mi uh, merely innate or can it be trained? And mm. of course, to follow up, how can one train to develop imagination if one can? I absolutely think like... There are very few things about being a human being that cannot be trained, right? How much of it you have innately, like that's a nature nurture thing that I don't know if I'll get into, but I, I mean, people can be trained to have better memories, right? People can be trained to be better at basically anything that we think we're, we're bad at. Like, um, I talk about, if I talked about this before, like I've tried to stop saying the phrase that we all use, oh, I'm just bad with names. Because my wife, who was a school teacher, um, kind of pointed out, like most people are bad with names, but you can be good with names if you try, right? She's like, I'm not good with names. I was a school teacher and made a concerted effort to learn to memorize all of my students' names um, because I thought it was important for teaching. And she got really good at it. And now she remembers people's names when they introduce themselves and, you know, puts a face to them and can remember that even weeks later because it's a skill she trained herself to have. Um, and I respect that, right? Like it, it kind of shows her care about people um, that she wanted to do that. And uh, I, so, yes, I think imagination can be trained. Um, now, there are some interesting things here. Like I find the people who do not... Uh, people's imaginations work differently. There are people who are, for instance, uh, face blindness is, uh, is related to this. There are people who do not picture things in their minds as they read them, that that's just not a way that their imagination works. Um, but those people are still creative and have an imagination. It's just a different style. So I think we can be trained. Um, and I do think that uh, fantasy novels are good, uh, good crunches for your imagination if you indeed want to train in imagining uh, better. I think writing is fantastic for that. When you have to be like, all right, I can't just have a, this setting. I have to describe it in a way that people are able to picture in their minds something similar to what I'm picturing that forces you to work a little harder um, and things like that. So, yes, Brian, I think you can train it, but I, I think that there are definitely certain things about our imaginations which are either innate or are uh, from us from a very young age, or with us from a very young age. Uh, Jeff Anderson says, uh, how do you feel about writing three capstone books in a row? And may, did you may have gone into this one last stream, or I just thought about no, it's uh, it is a good but, question. Uh, um, so yeah, Waxwing Four, Skyward Four, and Stormlight yeah. Five all in a row. It's it is interesting to have this happening. Like it just kind of lined up that way. Um, it's gonna be very. It's feeling very relieving, right? That I these things. I really like endings. I enjoy writing endings. I write enjoy writing endings of series, and also I enjoy. Uh, the sensation of having completed something is a very satisfying s sensation to me, right? It's part of why I keep writing um, and why my work ethics works the way it does is because having finished something is just very innately satisfying. And um, I do know that, for instance, you know, I have had uh, quite a great um, time having my career take off as it has over these last 15 years, uh, 16 now. Um, but for the longest time, I, I felt a little awkward because I hadn't finished that much. I had 
you know, basically finished more series for other authors than I had for myself. I'm exaggerating, but it felt that way at times. Um, and I feel like a piece of art isn't complete, isn't, you know, like people, that, there's a Hugo Award for best series, right? And I'm like, I don't really feel like I can can put the way of King, the Stormlight Arca up and say, hey, you guys should vote for this until you know if the series finishes well, right? And I think we saw that with Game of Thrones, um, that a lot of people feeling that the ending did not finish the way they wanted to, uh, tainted the entire project for a lot of people. Um, and so it's pretty valid to say, well, until the series is done, we don't know how good it is. Um, and I look forward, I like finishing things because that allows that to be like, how is the series? And um, having these kind of mid mega series capstones like this uh, with Stormlight and with uh, with Mistborn um, allows kind of to have the best of both worlds where there is a portion that is finished um, and can be can be viewed as a single entity um, and kind of uh, responded to in that way. Uh, so I am really excited for the next two years. Um, we are only now, seems, seems incredible, but we are about seven months away from when I'll be starting another Stormlight book. Um, so, uh, that is just mind boggling to me. Uh, all of you guys are like, oh, I can't believe you waited this long. But for us, like Stormlight books are so intense and take so much work and things like that, that, um, yeah, uh, to have one, uh, coming up again, because I, I write those. Uh, to be released every three years has been my goal recently, and they take about 18 months, so I will start that one on January 1st. Um, so there we are. It's already coming. That means the team needs to be ready for the Words of Radiance uh, Kickstarter. Uh, oh, no. Mm -hmm. We start January 1st, too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, for those who are wondering, I do have a mini Kickstarter update here. This will go on my weekly update also, but if you're curious... Um, we are very close to uh, having ready to start shipping the 2021 leather bounds. Um, uh, I thought those have been going out. I was incorrect. Those are going out starting probably June 1st. That's the goal uh, that we will start. And they will take like two months or more to ship out because there's like 15,000 of them or something like that. Uh, and so basically as the bindery finishes them, it will ship them out in groups as it's like, we've finished, you know, this pallet worth, and then those will just go out. So uh, if you were part of the 2021 group, you should be getting them. Uh, this would be good because we're really hoping that everyone can have their book by w the one year date of the Kickstarter ending that we'll meet it within a few weeks or so, but I'm not sure. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Really good. Um, and swag bundles are continuing to go out. Those will still take another, another couple months at most, um, as we're about a third of the way through those and there will be no interruption between the 2020 and 2021 version of those. They'll just continue to go out. But the leather bounds, if you, if you weren't aware, we had gotten 10,000 of them ready that we could knew we could get out, uh, by 2020, but getting, Getting these leather bounds done is a, is a big effort on the binderies part. And so when we opened up the 2021 ones, we knew, because partially I had to sign them all, that it was going to take us a while. So that's why those were in two phases and two batches. And you should know when you did the Kickstarter if you were 2020 or 2021. The inevitable question that will uh, follow is, can I get copies of the leather bound if I was not in the Kickstarter? And the answer will be yes but not until everyone in the Kickstarter has their copies. And then we will, uh, we will start making them available uh, on our web store, probably some for Christmas, but probably not a ton yet, because again, I have to sign big swaths of them to make that happen. And our focus has been completely on getting the ones that we have already sold to the people who bought them. So, um, but those are already signed, your, your 2021. So they, they're being shipped to the printer and the slip cases are getting, getting made and the, uh, the covers are getting made. And as soon as that's all, they'll be able to start sticking them all together and sending them off. So that's where we are. Um, if you've been waiting in breathless anticipation, it is coming soon. Actually, one of my business colleagues that I was on a phone call today said, I'm really waiting for mine because uh, I'm going to read the book when it comes because he hasn't read Stormlight. He's only read Mistborn. Um, and I'm like, uh, 
I can probably get you, uh, you know, a copy of Way of Kings if you want to read it. He's like, no, I want to read the Leatherbound. I want to read with all the art and all that stuff. And so I was a little surprised because for me, Leatherbounds go on the shelf prettily. And then I have a paperback that's somewhere that I read. Uh, but he's, he's looking forward to digging into the actual Leatherbound and reading it. So uh, From the chat... Uh, El Mago 85 mm -hmm. says, first time to catch a live signing. Hello from Denmark. Hey, hello back to you. Um, it's probably very early in the morning. Yes. Uh, my, um, my ancestry is from Denmark. Um, that's the sun. That's yes. Um, uh, that part's actually, um, and not Anglo Saxon. It's probably Norman. Mm -hmm. Um, this, the Sanderson the is, is Alexanderson. And I think that comes, it's actually the Hansons. H-A-N-S-E-N, which is my mother's mother. That's all a Danish line. Um, and uh, so, um, yes, that is your children's line as well, since uh, you're married to my sister. Uh, but yes, the Hansons. Um, my, my grandma, um, Sanderson, um, who is was a Hanson before she got married, my grandma Sanderson always would tell me the story that um, she says in our genealogy, um, she would preface it by saying, you're related to Hamlet. Um, and yeah, she was an English teacher, so made sense. She, but she said that there was an illegitimate, the one, that our family line came from an illegitimate son of the royal line. Um, I have not been able to confirm this in my own research about our family line, but she knew before she passed away, she knew way more about this than I do. And so, um, it, it's perhaps in there. So perhaps I am the, uh, the, uh, uh, a, a lost uh, scion of the the Danish royal line. Uh, knowing how um, how royalty was in the back in the day, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, many of us uh, are traceable to one of the various uh, uh, royal lines. So, I am not a lost king of Denmark though, um, because not only illegitimate but through various matriarchal lines. So, but I am I am related to Hamlet. I'll take I'll accept <laughs> that. You know. Uh, Animals 555 uh, mm -hmm. says, there seems to be a lot of influence from Taoism and Taoism and Mistborn. Is this deliberate? Uh, yes, um, it is. Uh, I just, you know, I really like philosophy. I really like world philosophy. I really like religion. I really like, really like the intersections between religion and philosophy that you get in Taoism, right? Like, um, and uh, these sorts of things you'll see popping up all over the place. And um, it is kind of interesting because a lot of the cultures of Mistborn are more European uh, influenced, but a lot of the philosophy is, is a little more Taoist. Um, but in Stormlight, a lot of the cultures are a little bit more Asian influenced, but the philosophy that's popping up is a little bit more European a lot of, uh, of the time. And that's just because it matched the narratives and what the characters I thought would actually be interested in talking about. Uh, though there is the whole um, uh, Shintoism uh, influence on the world building of uh, Stormlight as well. So, yeah. Anyway, yes, uh, there, there's definitely some Taoism um, uh, sneaking around through uh, Mistborn, and that is intentional. Uh, and apparently it's 2.30 in Sweden. 2.30 in Sweden. Ooh. So I have never been to Sweden or Denmark. I have only been to Norway. Uh, the bookstore there in Norway and Oslo invited me. I had a wonderful time. I uh, did, did not so much love the whole it being 2 a.m. and being uh, being bright um, and... Uh, and uh, well, not not quite bright. It was more like it felt like it was like six or Permit seven. Dusk or something. Uh, like that. Yeah, it was. I would love that dusk. for golf. That would be great for golf. But I'm, you know, I'm a vampire, so mm. I like things. Uh, I like I like the darkness. Um, I just, you know, I work at night. Night is soothing to me, and so um, when whenever we get to the part where of the year where it's getting light, the staying light later and getting light in the mornings earlier, I'm just. Uh, I, I, I prefer the fall in the spring to, uh, to that. Winter, you know, is not uh, my favorite season just because winter in Utah, though it's not as bad as some places, certainly not as bad as Nebraska, just, you know, f fall, fall is where I, I like to reside. So. Uh, and many people are commenting on your Chocobo shirt. Yes. Uh, wondering if you have a favorite Final Fantasy. Or... Um, my favorite Final Fantasy is ten. Uh, 10 is my, um, so adding voice acting to the characters as 10 did was a big, uh, thing for my engagement with the characters. Now I've played 
Uh, all final, all the Final Fantasies, except for the um, the MMO ones, um, all the mainline at least, and um, you know, I uh, I did do the the Final Fantasy one challenge of uh, of beat it with four clerics uh, or white white mages, I suppose, has been done. I know that's a meme, but I I saw the meme and so I did it. But the, I did actually beat it with one. Black belt, uh, one one uh, where I had to leave all the other characters dead and try to get through it. So uh, that was fun. That was different. Uh, that was back when I had too much time in college. And I'm like, ooh, I really like this old game. Let's see if I can beat it with just one character. Um, and so that was not not necessarily recommended uh, <laughs> gameplay. Um, you can't save before dungeons in a lot of Final Fantasies. Like Final Fantasy One, as I recall, you couldn't save before dungeons, and so the boss beat you. That was bad, and several of the bosses had auto kills that were not supposed to be that big a deal because you have a four-member party. But um, when you're only using one, that's a digression. Uh, I really like Ten. I like Ten's characters. I like Ten's story. Um, I liked Ken Ten's mini games. Uh, Ten is like the perfect storm for Final Fantasy for me, where. Um, the goofy Final Fantasy story really worked for me, and I was, I, you know, everyone loves 7. I do love 7, but after 7 and 8, uh, in particular, I was ready for a, uh, non-emo protagonist, <laughs> and, uh, so, yeah, um, so Titus, just kind of being non-emo and, uh, and happy-go-lucky, uh, was was the right time for me. I like the world building of what Yuna's doing with you know and all of that. It just it was it was cool to see a character's um, class integrated so well into the world building and mythology. And then the voice acting was just great. So uh, so thumbs up from ten for ten. But um, I would say number two for me is probably seven for nostalgia's sake. Like, I know a lot of people prefer six, um, but, you know, the, the full motion videos and stuff for seven really did have an impact on me. And they were mind-blowing yeah, at the time. Yeah, at the time, they were just incredible. Yeah. Um, and then after that, it's probably, for me, um, I think it's 12, uh, just for the, the side character of the captain, who um, who is the guy who always is like, he, he's talking about how he's the protagonist and all of these sort of narrative jokes. I just love that guy. Uh, every line of dialogue that came out of his mouth. Um, even though uh, he did, had one of my least favorite things involved in that, uh, in that show was the, the JRPG um, women wear lingerie as armor. Uh, like he had a bunny girl sidekick who wore lingerie as her armor. And I'm like, I just could not take it seriously. Uh, it was... Yeah, um, I uh, I don't I don't I don't prefer that uh, that method of uh, of uh, let's just say of costuming. But he was great. Um, and then probably eight, and then six, probably for me. Um, one is still up there just because of the memes, like um, you know the meme runs that I've done, and I've probably played it through more times than anything else. Um, I did not ever play. The ones that were in um, Japan and didn't come to the States uh, originally, right? So like Final Fantasy II um, did, not, did not come to the States. I think we got one, four, and six. I could be wrong on that. I think six was Final Fantasy III to me back when I was a kid and had a, um, a Super Nintendo. Um, and two and three did not come. Um, so I never played whichever ones those are. Um, um, but, um, and, um, the one with lightning and the boy band, those two more recent ones, um, I think that just turn-based combat, it's just not a thing that I love anymore. Um, I just have so much trouble. Even the one with the boy band, um, 15, um, uh, I'm joking there, you know, but they, they really were like a boy band. They had really, uh, some fun, uh, some characters in that, but even that one trying to be more active, it, it felt so button mashy to me. Um, that one actually kind of also turned me off because we hit um, girl from the with a southern accent. The truck stop. At the truck station. stop, and the accent was so grating, and her costume was so grating that I it turned me off on that that one for a while. But yeah, um, like come on, 
come on guys. Can we can we just get some depth to some more of our side characters? Some of the women in particular would be really nice. Um, but yeah, anyway, JRPGs, there you go. Yep. I am not the biggest JRPG person. Um, like, um, uh, I would, I would rank Dark Souls above any of the, the Final Fantasies if I just am wanting something to play. Though 10 has a very special place in my heart. Um, did you play the new Final Fantasy? The Final Fantasy VII Remake? Uh, I did not play okay. Remake. Um, so, I... I was tempted. Um, number one, as I, I think I've talked about before, my kids have the PS4. Like, I have a gaming computer. And uh, I don't know if Remake is on the computer um, or things like that, but everything I heard from people was that the stuff that was from the original is great, and all the new stuff a lot of re reviews were saying was like, meh. Um, and I'm just worried that, again, turn-based combat just bores me. I don't have time for it anymore like I used to. I can't go, you know, I, I used to be able to be like, oh yeah, I'm going to breed a golden chocobo and go get Knights of the Round Table as a summoning. That sounds like a fun thing to do. Um, and these days I look at uh, and I'm like, I do not have time for that. I, I don't have time to, to, to sit there and have each, like I want to be having fun. I want to be playing Doom when I'm, uh, when I'm in the combat in a video game. Um, I do not want to be like, Whoosh, all right, now select a thing and select another thing. Um, but difficulty is a thing I've had a problem with with the Final Fantasies for a while. Um, like, um, it's very hard to make the game fun and challenging for me um, in that format. They're trying to tell cinematic movie or movies in video game form, right? Which is, you know, makes sense, but... I really like a challenge in video games, um, and not having a challenge, it's hard for me to play games. And challenge doesn't have to make, be hard. Like, new game mechanics that I'm still figuring out can be really fun, um, and things like that. Or, you know, the challenge of, like, like, I don't know that I would call Undertale, at least uh, most of the types of runs you can do, challenging, but I loved Undertale because figuring out what was going on with that game and how it was working was its own delightful uh, uh, like present, right? Um, and so it doesn't have to just be Dark Souls level difficulty, um, but I need, I need something that feels new and interesting that I'm figuring out and uh, that's engaging me on more than just a... Yeah, so 15 tried that and um, didn't work for me. Some people have said that I know said that they really like 7 Remakes, um, but I'm also like, so 7 Remake is only a part of it? Like, okay, I'll play it maybe when I can play the whole thing? So. That makes sense. Mm-hmm. Um, Frederick Bass from the chat wants to know uh, if you could collaborate with any dead author in history, who would it be and why? Uh, Robert Jordan. Uh, I've answered this was, before. Yeah, that was uh, yep. too much of a softball. <laughs> yep, Robert Jordan, because uh, being able to get uh, Robert Jordan back to be like, all right, uh, what about this thing? I didn't, like, let's do, like, um, if I could commune beyond the grave and be like, all right, all right, Jim. Tell me what I messed up. Let's do a different version that's, that fixes the things that you are annoyed about that I did wrong. Um, that, that would be delightful, um, you know. Um, but, you know, also proving a life beyond the grave would also probably be a bigger deal. But, you know. Um, who else would I pick that I would collaborate with? Um, I don't know. Um, oh, something just turned on in here. Um... I have said before in the past, and I still think that um, that Anne McCaffrey would be fun to collaborate with because she did a lot of collaborations, and I'm very fond of her writing. So that's uh, that's an option, yeah. Um, but I, I would definitely say Robert Jordan. Um, and I think that's a fine answer, and mm -hmm. especially since you already kind of yeah, kind of were did able to right. I, I clad yes, yeah, so it would be get, getting to be able to refine what I have done with his input would be uh, very cool. Mm -hmm. um, Nolan Cartledge from the chat uh, says any uh, they're looking for, for advice on getting over fear of starting their first book. Okay. Um, so this is going to depend on your personal psychology, um, but 
uh, there are there. Are, so how about this? Some of the things I could say here could be wrong for your personal psychology. So I'm going to give a couple of different options. What was really helpful for me and my psychology was taking the pressure off that first book for acknowledging to myself that my first book's job was not to make me a professional writer. Um, it was not even to write a good book. My first book's job was to get me in the habit of writing. And because of that, um, I wasn't able to finish a book until I set aside the, uh, the book that, uh, called Dragonsteel that I've been working on for years and years in my head that was like perfect in my imagination. And um, I was too afraid to start because I would screw it up until I just am like, you know, what? I'm going to do this other story, this thing that just occurred to me. Um, and there's no stress because if I mess this one up, well, it's not the perfect book that I've been planning forever that I still haven't written, um, Dragonsteel. But... Um, that, that taking the pressure off, hearing that your first five books are generally uh, pretty bad um, and it's okay, was really good for me. I have known other people that that is terrible advice for. That getting in their head that the, the book is probably not going to be that great is just a huge motivation killer. Where for me, it was like, oh, good. I don't have to be very good yet. I can just enjoy it for me. Um, and so for other people, uh, getting that courage up is about picking the right reward. Uh, for finishing it, for you know, working on it daily, uh, setting up a schedule and saying, here's what I'm going to do and here's the reward if I do this thing. That could be the right thing for you. Um, for others, like I often joke, this was, this was partially there. Like when I finally finished that first book, part of it was also me wanting to be a writer and knowing if I didn't start doing this, that I would have to end up doing something else as a job. And I knew that writing as a job was a hard thing to do, but there was zero chance if I didn't start writing. And so I often joke that during those days, I saw a fandom cubicle chasing me and that if it caught me, I turned into an insurance actuary instead of a writer or something like that. And um, I would always be, you know, looking over my shoulder for the, um, the phantom cubicle. And part of what kept me writing was knowing that I wanted that chance at being a professional novelist. And so maybe that would work for you. Um, maybe starting a writing group, right? Writing groups are good for pe some people and terrible for others. Um, the, one of the best things they can do, though, is give you motivation. If people in your writing group are like, I want to read the next chapter. Please write the next chapter. It can give you a lot of motivation to keep going. Uh, so all of these things. But if you're, if you're afraid, if you're nervous, um, don't worry. You can't screw it up because the main job for it to do is to, uh, is to get you writing. So merely writing is, is accomplishing the goal. Uh, you can always fix it later on. I took my first finished novel and I rewrote it years later and it became White Sand and now it's published as a graphic novel, right? You can, even if it's not going to be perfect, you can fix it later on after your skill goes up and your skill will never in your entire life improve as quickly as it will writing your first novel. Um, and the ability to watch how, how much better you get from chapter one to the end is part of the fun of writing that first book. So just jump in and do it. Uh, it's just, a, just like you're just picking up a, an instrument and starting. Uh, don't worry about how good you are right now. Just, just do it. Writing is different from instruments, though, in that um, a lot of us have been writing since we were, you know, five or six, right? We feel like we should know how to write, but constructing a narrative is a different kind of writing. And so we feel upset with ourselves. We feel ashamed when it doesn't quite match, or we feel very nervous that it won't um, and that we will be wasting our time or other people's time. You're not wasting your time if you're making yourself a better writer, which is what you'll be doing. So that is my bit of advice on it. It is partially what worked for me. Maybe ask some other authors what worked for them, but uh, good luck to you. I hope that you, you do it. It is a worthwhile and satisfactory thing to do, completely separated from any monetary or career aspirations. Simply writing a novel, it's like, it's like running a marathon. Um, it's a thing. You don't have to come in first place for that to have been a massive undertaking that is very good for you to have done. Um, 
So. So you're saying that me having the expectation of being a number one New York Times bestseller on my debut novel yeah. is probably I mean, not, the, not the right expectation? It, it, it can happen. You are internet personality oh, and no. YouTube co-star oh, thank you. Adam Horn, <laughs> uh, producer uh, extraordinaire. So... Um, but yes. Um, now I'm just going to wait for uh, Kathy to spam the chat telling everyone how terrible my book is. Mm. If, you, uh, if you put that onus upon yourself, then it's going to be, <laughs> it's, it's an unfair onus to put upon the book. There are people who have been number one sellers on their first novel, uh, but don't even think about that. Think about how good it is to be writing a story and to, to finish it. And finish your book, Adam, because if you do, it's like I said, writing, re yes. writing that marathon. I'm, I'm working on it. You, uh, yeah. Oh, I hear he's doing a wonderful job from a member of his writing group who is here. She is a terrible lighter. <laughs> um, I saw a question pass just now. They want to know if you'd pick Shardblade or Lightsaber. Uh, I would pick Shardblade because, so you know, solidarity, right? I'm not going to pick a Lightsaber. If well, I, that yeah. and you can never lose it. Yes. Uh, and does the shard blade, you know, might come with a friend? Oh, um, that's true. Yes. You'll so, never be lonely. Uh-huh. Um, so, you know, um, I mean, lightsabers are iconic. They're cool. If I hadn't created shard blades, I might pick lightsaber, right? But, um, you know, if we could make lightsabers, the other thing is, you know, a lightsaber, the technology involved in making a lightsaber could probably cause enormous good in the uh in the world by just giving it up to someone to study so that we could uh you know create power sources that self-contained and uh you know things like that so but yeah it being quote unquote technology might have better good for the universe if you pick or for the for the world if you picked lightsaber but if that's not on the table then lightsabers get a little less interesting i mean the fact that they don't have cross guards right that's uh <laughs> mm. except for one um that's a i wouldn't want to fight with a lightsaber uh there's a reason there's so many people missing hands um and and uh the, 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 there's really a big design flaw in how lightsabers work and they even slide along each other if you see people fighting with them i know it drives the the actual hema people like shad insane that the way lightsabers uh work but um yeah you might be you might be safer with a shard blade your Probably. hands might be, at least. Um, Liam Bao says, how do authors feel, and I'm assuming we can just narrow that down to you, mm -hmm. uh, about closing the proverbial book on POV characters part of the story? Oh, so like the final time you write a character's viewpoint, mm -hmm. I think. Um, so it's, it's not as, it, it is a little bittersweet, <clears throat> but not so much as it is for a reader. It's a different experience for a reader because an author, you have control. Um, right. If you really were sad about this, you can write a prequel. You can write an inquil. You can write a short story. You can go back to that character's viewpoint. Um, it's different for me because when I closed the book on Wheel of Time characters, I knew that wasn't ever going to happen. Right. I had already told Harriet that I would n not write um, more Wheel of Time. Um, you can see my fact question on this on youtube for why it's a big long story talking about it there um but she also had the same mindset she wasn't like she was fresh me and she just was curious what my thoughts were um and i knew that this was it this was this was being done um i've likened uh it to carrying the one ring right the, when i had the wheel of time and i gave that ring back um and it became harriet's burden there and so finishing those characters um, was more bittersweet. Uh, but at the same time, the way that I work as a writer is that I generally know a character's journey um, from you know the early pages of the first book. I know where they're going, where they'll end up. Now, this isn't always 100% accurate, but I'm always along for that journey and I'm always looking ahead. And uh, by the time I write that the end or whatever for their last viewpoint um i have been anticipating and planning for that moment for months perhaps years um and so it is a different it's more of a this thing it's almost like in my head the book is already done and the writing it out is a formality so the rest of you can experience it um and for me that character's ending has already kind of happened 
and it happened years ago and it happened perpetually. Like I wrote the book as a chronicle of this character's life already knowing it. Um, it's like I'm writing a biography, not writing um, a fiction, a piece of fiction. And that changes my perspective on it. Um, I, I don't regret to the same extent. It's more like I'm um, when, when a character dies or when I'm done with a thing, it's like this is the thing I set out to do and it is satisfying to finally be able to let other people see the thing that in my head has already been in existence for years and years and years. Uh, Brandon Bennett says, how much planning goes into a whole series, trilogy or larger, when you begin writing the first book? Do you go out in the first book in depth and keep a looser outline for the others, or do you work out everything before writing? Um, so it's what you said the first time. Generally, I will do a pretty solid outline for a book one, um, and then I will write the first book, and then I will outline the rest of the series, and it will be a looser outline. It'll be, you know, um, a couple pages per book. Um, I mean, I don't look at it as pages, so it's hard to say, but it is a looser outline. And then as I come to each book, I will, um, I will fill out that outline um, and make a very solid outline for that book in the series. Uh, so the big outline for a series often happens after the first book. Now, there are a couple of exceptions. The big exception in my case is Stormlight. Uh, so Stormlight um, is, uh, is an oddity in many different ways. Stormlight has about half of Dragonsteel, the book that I wanted to write when I was you know, a kid, and I put aside to write uh, White Sand, my first novel, and I eventually came back to um, and uh, wrote Dragonsteel Prime, and then eventually took half of that, or a chunk of that, and made it into um, Way of Kings Prime, or no, made a little bit of it into Way of Kings. It really ended when it became the actual Way of Kings. This is all convoluted and complicated, but the end result is Stormlight has a much, much bigger lead time than any other book series I've worked on, um, and has had uh, more iterations and more plans and more outlines than anything else. And that's just part of the nature of the beast, right? The, the fact that it is so big um, and it is such kind of a major cornerstone of the Cosmere. Um, it, um, uh, Dragonsteel, when I actually do it, and Mistborn are just going to, they're different animals from the uh, rest of the series I do. But if you want to take like uh, um, an average one, Skyward is a great example. I did an outline for Skyward, I wrote the book, and then I sat down and I created an outline for the series, which is uh, several pages per book that I sent to my publisher. Um, they gave a thumbs up. Um, and then when it's come time to write each of those other books, I pull out that outline that I wrote for that series and I expand it and tweak it and um, make changes based on things that I altered while I was writing the, the book and then I write the book. Um, so, um, <clears throat> Maria McDonald says, what's some popular writing advice that works for many, but hasn't worked as well for you? Oh, that's a great question that I have not been asked. And they want to know what you do instead, which probably varies. Yeah. On the Ooh, wow. What's some popular writing advice that I do not follow? Huh. I'm going to have to think about this one for a sec. Hmm. This is not hugely popular writing advice, but it is popular among a segment of writers who I respect, um, which is the Heinlein philosophy, which is don't revise or resist revision. Uh, I would say this is less popular than what I do, which is extensive revision. Um, but there, I'm just baffled by the people who kind of follow the Heinlein road, which is write your book, be done with it in one or two drafts, don't revise unless someone is buying it, and the person who is buying it is giving you the editorial mandate to revise. Um, I, I, it just confuses me. A lot of this crowd do not like beta readers. They do not like, and some of these people, you know, I know quite well and um, and whatnot, but do not like any sort of, um, you know, it's like you have to create, your artistic vision is your first draft, and you want to preserve that is kind of how they view it, and you want uh, to not ruin the raw um, 
unfiltered uh, creativity that goes into a first draft. And I am very much on the other side of that. Um, I feel like a rough draft is like a half-finished sculpture where you've gotten the shape of the um, of the thing you're making, but it takes a ton of refinement and work and playing off of what uh, what early readers say to better gauge um, how, you're, you, how you want to target it. But that one doesn't quite answer the question because it's not... Uh, I think that revision, p authors who revise, I think, high, uh, greatly outweigh um, those who don't revise. And so um, it's a good weight joke in there for you if you uh, wanted to make it. Um, what's, a, what's a piece of, uh, of writing advice that I just do not follow at all? I have no idea. What's that? Writing sprints. Oh, there's a good one. I don't like writing sprints. Yeah, yeah. I don't use writing sprints. Uh, how, how did you even pull that out, Kara? How did you know that? I don't know. I, just, I go to a lot of your conventions. Yeah. I've, I've heard you talk about that you uh, don't do writing yeah. sprints. Yeah, a lot of the uh, uh, my author's friends do writing sprints. So what is a writing sprint? A writing sprint is where you um, sit and you just write. Um, and you don't, you, you like time it and you see how much you can get in this short amount of time. Um, and you don't go in with a premise or anything, and you just go. And they really like them. It's kind of liberating to them. It helps them turn off their internal editor. Um, it helps them, you know, be super creative um, and things like that. Basically, it solves a bunch of problems that I don't have in my writing. Um, I never lack for something to write. Um, I don't lack for motivation or consistency. Um, and so a writing sprint is just like, I could have spent that time working on something that I actually want to get done, that I have a deadline for. Um, I don't want to writing sprint. Um, uh, and I don't, like, it doesn't do me much good to just be like, go, don't plan. I'm like, story will be better if I plan it a little bit. I know what will make one of my stories better. I know what makes me excited about a story turning out. And so I would rather take 15 minutes up front consider the story that I want to tell and then make the first draft a little cleaner and stronger because of that. And so uh, I do not like writing sprints. Um, I do not do writing sprints. I don't do a lot of the writing exercises that, uh, that professors um, like to, to use that uh, a lot of my writing friends like to use and talk about. I just, I don't need to do that. Now the things I do think as writing exercises that are useful uh, for me are ones that focus on a specific type of writing that you're not as good at to try to strengthen that. I've talked for about, you know, write, di writing dialogue only scenes with no tags and making sure that your characters all sound like that's a good skill to practice. Um, being able to write so you can tell your, so a reader can tell your characters apart with no dialogue tags and no setting details um, is is a useful thing to strengthen part, particular muscles in the writing uh, process. But um, yeah, just, just writing sprints, just to get yourself writing. I don't need that. Um, I need more time to finish the books that I have, uh, I've planned to do and that I want to do. So, um, A friend of the program, Darcy Cole. Hey, Darcy, how you doing? Uh, another beta reader. Uh, um, any advice for forcing oneself to work when the rest of one's life is super stressful? Oh, man, Darcy. Oh, I am sorry. Um, my advice is to ask an author other than me. Um, uh, I can, of course, opine as I, per as I am wont to do. Um, but the truth is, I am not a high-stress individual. And um, I have never had a period in my life where super high-stress... Um, was a hindrance to me writing. I've had lots of friends that that is the case. And this is because of um, the fact, the way I kind of interact with stress is different from a lot of people. It just does not hit me the same way it does for a lot of people. Um, and so uh, if <clears throat> that means that if I did have like a super high stress time, I would probably crumple and not get anything done. So, uh, so I could probably use whatever advice you get from other authors. Um, but... I do know that like COVID was a high stress, a kind of low, um, how should I say? Let's see if I can explain it. A low level of stress f for a lot of people that just did not go away. Like a, a mini sense of panic that lasted for months. Um, and so I bet a lot of writers uh, could give you advice. I know a lot of my writing friends did not get a lot done. Uh, during the the whole uh, early parts of COVID and even the later parts of COVID. Um, and I guess this comes down to understanding your own psychology. Like, how can you make writing 
a relaxing thing. One of the reasons my life is, I think, so relatively low stress is that going to writing is how I decompress and um, like how I, if, if, if something is bothering me or whatnot, writing will relax me. Um, and making writing into that might be some advice I could give to you, which is take away some of the pressures that are forcing you to stress about your writing. Um, that might be a way to do it. Turn writing into the refuge that you go to uh, when other things are going really, really stressful. But I don't know. Again, this is a better question maybe for you know Mary Robinette um, or someone like that who has more firsthand experience in making this happen. Uh, I didn't catch the name on the chat, but they wanted to know what your favorite movie was. Favorite movie? If you can narrow it yeah. down. I usually have a, a couple of, of go-tos. Um, you know, we'll, we'll set aside the what does it mean to be favorite and did, did it change? I mean, for all of us, it probably changes and stuff. Um, generally, my favorite movies, um, Gattaca is usually one of the ones I mention. I just really love how Gattaca um, just the various pieces of it work and what it's uh, what it does, and I love the the cinematography, and I really like the acting um, and things like that. Um, I will often point to Die Hard as I think my favorite like script, just the tightest, uh, strongest, most interesting and well put together screenplay. Um, and I just Die Hard how it again works as a story is so interesting uh, to me, and um, I'm I'm. Say a big fan. Um, from there, what are some of my other like absolute things that would answer favorite movie? Um, I, I really like heist films in general, so I happen to really like Inception. I really like um, I really like uh, uh, Nolan, Christopher Nolan, and I really like heist movies. So that's a good match. Um, but when we were even talking about Christopher Nolan movies once, I didn't even land on that one until someone brought it up. So who knows? And I think I've heard you talk about Knives Out recently as well. I really thought Knives Out was excellent. Yeah. Uh, one of my favorites in recent years for sure. But I mean, um, Knives Out might have been my favorite movie of recent times if I didn't like Infinity War so much. Mm. Uh, Infinity War with Endgame as a one-two punch is just... Uh, Particularly, I just really, really like how Infinity War framed the villain as the protagonist. Uh, that's hard to do, and they pulled it off really well. And uh, no spoilers, but I really like that movie for the same reason I like fi a lot of people like Final Fantasy VI. Indeed, my favorite like moment in Final Fantasy is probably in Final Fantasy VI, and it's a moment similar to something that is in. Uh, yeah, I mean, it is a 30-year-old game now, but uh, just saying there's, there's a certain event in that, uh, in that game which uh, breaks the, broke the brain of a lot of teenage gamers at, during the era. Um, and it is the single best moment in a Final Fantasy game, I think, uh, which is, you know, why a lot of people really, really love it. Um, and so uh, Infinity War pulling that off and Endgame kind of just giving such a satisfying resolution to a bunch of character arcs. Like, um, it is unfortunate for Into the Spider-Verse and Knives Out, which are two of my uh, favorite movies of recent years, that they had to come out so close to uh, Infinity War and Endgame, which just kind of take the crown in, of recent movies. Um, uh, that It's just so good. Um, Knives Out is great. Um, I yeah, um, because I'm not the biggest Last Jedi fan, um, I was uh, I was surprised by how much I liked the writing of Knives Out uh, because the writing of um, of Last Jedi is part of what the problem I have with it. Right, it's not the acting, it's not the cinematography, it is the script, um, and yet Knives Out is just really, really good, uh, an excellent script um, that that is that is loving toward the old entries in that same genre while at the same time doing something revolutionary with it. Like, that's what you want to see, right? You don't want to see, um, it, like, a cynical takedown is not at least as fun to me as a loving evolution of, um, of an old beloved, in this case, the, 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 uh, the closed room mystery. What do they call them? Like, a set group of uh, suspects um, and kind of being locked in a room with them, even though they're not technically locked in the room. They're moving around and going. But that's, that's the kind of the format of that film. It's just, 
Um, and then it changes to something else halfway through and uh, then comes back to it. Man, it's really a clever script and uh, with a lot of character emotion and stuff like that. So it's a, it's a good movie. It's an, no, it's, it's an excellent movie. Let's say that. So so I don't know if you've seen the same rumors that I have online about them mm-hmm. making a super extended cut of Infinity War like oh. they did for Snyder Cut. Oh, I don't because know. Because they saw the success of Snyder yeah. Cut. I mean, I don't need to be behind that, right? Yeah, I heard uh, I, I they... The number that's coming to mind is like a six-hour cut of each movie. Mm, wow! So much material. That'd be so cool. Um, yeah, I would. I would joke about doing that with some of my books or things like that. But the <laughs> thing is, we, we, they're already big. <laughs> I already don't have to trim down uh, to meet an arbitrary uh, length, and so we just. Uh, if I want it in the book, it goes in the book. So uh, so we don't have a ton on the cutting room floor. What's on the cutting room floor for like Stormlight is like a sentence that repeats basically what the sentence before it said um, rather than entire scenes or things like that. So uh, not, not able to do that, though I've always wanted to do a super cut of the last three Wheel of Time books where I rearranged the timeline to better match the original outline that I had um, and do them as one enormous book um, instead of instead of three. But, you know, I'm sure Field Wheel of Time fans would like that, but I don't think it would actually be worth the effort to go through to do it. Uh, so Zach Mick says, um, you often stress how becoming a writer means starting a business. Mm-hmm. With the success of the Kickstarter, did you ever anticipate how impactful Dragonsteel Entertainment would be in your writing life? No, I did not. Um, if I had, I would have probably gotten uh, this all going sooner. Um, <laughs> like most authors, I kind of fell into it, right? Like, I did not even have an assistant until Kevin J. Anderson um, was said to me, you really should have an assistant by now, Brandon. I'm like, oh, well, maybe I should, but would I have anything for them to do? And I remember calling Peter, uh, who was my first hire, um, and saying, I'm worried, you know, that it's only like going to be half time work. And I might only be able to fill like 20 hours a week. And he's like, well, I can pick up freelance stuff. Um, and he was in a part in his life where this was a really nice thing. Uh, and so he came and it did not take us long before we had like 20 people, right? Uh, in the, in the, 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 yeah. Um, like it was probably under 10 years that everybody uh, that all the officers were hired and we had everything going from, from that first hire of Peter. I mean, I've been here for almost seven years. You've been here for seven years. Yeah, I've almost. been here for eight. Yeah, so, yeah. so, okay. yeah. Yeah, and so, and we, I hired Peter when I was working on the Wheel of Time, but it wasn't out yet, so it'd be like 2009, so yeah. So if you've been here for seven years-ish, almost. then, like, from 2009 to, like, what, 2015 then? So in six years, we built the entire thing. Um, and you know, uh, once I realized how handy it was, um, and also, you know, I am different from some authors, uh, from, we're all different. We're all unique, uh, special, um, snowflakes, but, um, uh, this is not to say that other people aren't, but a lot of authors do not, um, were not trained by a highly motivated accountant like my mother, right? I've often talked about part of the secret of my success is, and we should probably pull these three folded ones off. Um, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, um, I'll pull those off. Um, so those can be sent to people. We've got three little uh, little defect ones here. So uh, happy little defects, happy little trees. Um, there are no accident or no no mistakes. There's only happy little accidents. Um, and so. Um, I, I have always had lofty goals and aspirations. I have always had, um, a side of my brain that says, I don't just like, I don't just want to be an author. Um, there's, there's a part of me that's like, I, I I don't, you know, um, how to explain this? Like, there's a part of me that wants to be Walt Disney. Or I usually use Stan Lee because I don't actually want to have theme parks or things. But I, I don't want to just be a writer. I want to create something that is, um, that is a large um, pop media 
movement, right? Like that's what I've wanted to do. I want, I want to do big things. I want to do epic things, um, not just with the books, but how the books are received and how the books are treated and how, how things happen with them. And that's always been part of what I wanted to do. That's why, you know, when Moshe, uh, when I called him and said, all right, here's the pitch on Mistborn. And I'm like, nine books, three trilogies of trilogies. Um, and he's like, wow, you're ambitious. And I'm like, you have no idea. Uh, wait, 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 wait until we get going. Um, and I've never wanted to leave the writing part behind, right? I don't want to... I don't want other people necessarily. I do want to involve them, like we're doing some of these novellas and stuff, but I've never wanted to do that, but I've always wanted to have something that is bigger than, you know, the classic author sitting in a, a chair, you know, releasing a book every five years um, and things like that, um, which there's nothing wrong with that, but a lot of my writer friends, that's kind of how they are, right? Um, like, this is... You, you, receive, you get a certain amount of success and the books start slowing down um, because of course they do. That's natural. You now can take all the time you want um, and you can enjoy your life and writers tend to not be these very, um, you know, I, I don't put a lot of stock into personality archetypes. You know, the red personality type. There aren't a lot of those, uh, you know, the writers who are the... Um, people starting, um, starting startups and trying to sell them and starting another startup and things. And I'm not that, but I think in epic terms and I have always wanted something that wasn't just a book series, but that was an entire universe. And I like being in control. Um, I like being able to release things via Kickstarter directly to the readers rather than, um, being the person who is, um, you know, the author that most authors are, that it's like you turn in the book and the publisher takes care of all that business side stuff. Um, and the author can go back to writing the books, which is great for a lot of people, but I want to be involved in that business side stuff. I want to see what's happening. I want to be part of it. I want to be pub a publisher. And so that's just part of how my makeup is. And most of, um, a lot of what the team does you guys can confirm this for me, is saying, all right, Brandon wants to do this thing. How on earth do we make this actually happen? Um, and uh, a smaller portion, but still important portion, is them saying, Brandon wants to do this thing. How do we tell him we can't do this thing yet? Uh, or maybe ever. Um, because, you know, Brandon will be like, hey, let's buy a bookstore. And everyone's like, ah, Brandon, how? Uh, yeah. Um, what's that? Yeah, Kara wants a bookstore too. Um, but there's a lot of things that I do that I, like, I'll, I'll say it to Isaac, and Isaac's like, oh, no, he's doing it again. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. that's, uh, that's his Isaac face. Uh, yeah. But, no, Isaac never says that. Isaac's just so, so Isaacly that he, Isaac, uh, art director Isaac, is always like, oh, well, that's really cool, Brandon. That's really interesting. And inside, he's screaming, right? Inside, he's like, ah! <laughs> um, but... You know, uh, on the external, he's like, wow, that's so cool, Brandon. That's really interesting. And, you know, he, he really wants to see it happen. But inside, I know he's screaming. <laughs> Isaac's the one that I've, uh, I, I, you know, like the, I, 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 if you watch the weekly updates, one of my more recent ones is a encyclopedia for the Stormlight Archive that lists all characters that comes with one of those little, um, a bookmark that is transparent that has, you know, like red on one side and blue on the other side. So in some of the text, you can't read it until you put the, the bookmark over it so that you can hide spoilers about the future evolution of the character and you can have the, it color-coded to the different books. And so if you've read this book, you can read this character's entry on this one. And if you read, like, I just think that's really cool. And I know that one just said I was going, ah. How, how do we fabricate that and make it happen? I have no idea, Brandon. Ah. He had to be on some uh, some phone calls today of quacky stuff I want to do. Um, that you know, he was very quiet. <laughs> um, Oki Speed and Off Road says I have a bunch of different stories in my head that I would like to write. Hmm. Any advice on keeping different stories from bleeding into each other? Yeah, so um, this comes into the more you practice, I feel like the easier this will be because sometimes you do want them to bleed into each other, right? 
Uh, what made Mistborn work is that it was a mashup of two ideas that alone just were not good enough to hold a story. But what you're noticing is a real thing. Um, you don't want every story to just be a hodgepodge of whatever ideas were occurring to you at the time. Instead, you want each story to be, to, to find its own theme and soul and things like that. And the more you write, the more you'll be able to identify that. But uh, one of the key ideas here is to make sure that with your book, you are looking at like, what is this book about? What are the parts of this book that really excite me? What are the ideas that enhance that idea, um, that, that central goal um, of, that, of this given story? And what are the ones that would just um, make the book go a completely different direction? Um, and um, how can I add ideas that enhance what my goal is for this story? Um, I, you know, a good example of this is um, if I had had a really great idea for the linguistics of a fantasy world and had been writing Mistborn at the time, it would have been probably a bad idea to add a huge linguistic portion to Mistborn because every, it was taking place in one city. Cultural, um, you know, clash between cultures was not a big deal um, in the way that the theme of the story was going, right? This was a heist novel. Um, and yes, there's some terrorist uh, versus uh, non-terrorist people things, and there continues to be in the storm uh, in the Mistborn books. But doing a big thing about the script and the writing just was not would not have enhanced that book. It would have been a thing that I added to that book that was a bad idea. Um, and instead, having an interesting textual thing for Elantris was a good enhancement for that book because the magic system is related to the writing. And um, having interesting textual th stuff in Stormlight with the writing is really useful because it reinforces some of the, the, the gender role stuff that is a big part of society um, in the Alethi culture that the characters are responding to, pushing back against, or, uh, or dealing with. And so in that case, it's a, two of my series having um, the, the actual writing, the, 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 the letters and things like that. Um, be part of the world building was really handy. And in, in Mistborn, instead of it being like we, we came up with the steel alphabet, it is there for visual coolness instead, right? Like instead of the linguistics being uh, very important with the writing system, how it works, we just wanted something that looked neat. And um, different. you'll have different goals for different books because of this. And so not letting them bleed, it comes down to, understanding what a story is trying to do and what you're trying to do with that story and trying to add ideas to it that enhance that instead of um, trying to do everything in every book. Uh, that's probably something you already knew. Um, I don't know that anything I said there was, was revolutionary, but maybe it'll reinforce what you were already kind of thinking, uh, and maybe that'll help you. Uh, Anthony A. says, you have mentioned how you deliberately write with a simpler prose style. Mm. Was this your original style, or did you have to cultivate it over time? Uh, I had to cultivate it over time. Um, as I've, uh, I've, famous, uh, I've mentioned before, if you, read, um, if you read my early books, I've read uh, some of them on stream, uh, I was going very much for a Tolkien-esque um, sort of flowery. Um, and because I was a new writer, it came out purple, but that's just because I was a new writer. I could have continued on that path. Um, and, um, instead I got very into, um, some of the kind of the writing philosophy of George Orwell and, uh, certain writers I really liked, um, studying how their writing worked and things like that. Um, and the kind of way that I landed is that I like transparent prose. Um, it's not simple to do. It actually is a lot of work. Um, and what you're asking yourself is, uh, how can I make sure that readability comes first so that nothing distracts the reader from the storytelling? Um, and then once you kind of, you can go too far on that, you then pull back because you do want to use flowery language sometimes. You do want to use a really killer metaphor. You do want to have a, a lavish description now and then. You do want to, to, to have these things in your writing, but when you're doing it kind of the way that I like to, what you're asking yourself is, um, how can this enhance a character's viewpoint, right? 
Like uh, when I wrote in Teravangian's viewpoint when he was um, when he was hyper intelligent, right? I went back and I instead used different models and guides for that chapter. That chapter should, I hope, read very differently. Um, I'm using different sentence structures on purpose. Um, I'm using kind of different seeds. I, I went back to, uh, to some Faulkner. Um, like, let's, let's see how Faulkner does it, because that feels right to me. Um, some of, the, some of the, the classic philosophers who write these sentences that are just impenetrable, um, but, uh, but are full of ideas. Um, when you read that, I want it to feel different. Uh, when you are in the uh, seeing through the eyes of someone who is a little bit more poetic, uh, like Shalon, then the writing gets a little more poetic um, and these sorts of things. That is something that I like to do as well. Uh, but the core ideal of my style is that if people can't, um, if the prose gets in the way of people being able to, um, to enjoy the storytelling, then the, can we, can we make the prose do something different? Um, and this is not that uncommon. I wouldn't. I, I would say that I, I think that I'm pretty good at this, um, but I am not the only one who is like this. This is um, just an adaptation on kind of a a, um, a standard um, pop media style. Um, I just have certain influences that make me, um, I mean, it, some of it is nuts and bolts, right? Some of it is stuff that you wouldn't even notice, such as making sure to put the dialogue tag as soon as clo the close uh, as possible to the beginning of a paragraph, as is reasonable for the text. Um, don't have these like long sentences with the dialogue tag at the end. Um, it's stuff like that. It's uh, get rid of the, uh, the, the passive voice. Uh, reconstruct sentences so that the logical flow of them and whatnot um, really, really works for enhancing uh, understandability. So you can see the characters, you can see what's going on and things like that. Um, and um, yeah, uh, it is, I don't think, um, like there were times earlier in my career where I thought that it was like a polar opposite of a flowery style. I actually don't think it is. Um, I think you can do, uh, I mean, in, in Grandpa Tolkien, I tend to point out as one of the best examples of this because Tolkien is you, very like understandable. It's very, in many ways, like you say, it's very simple um, and yet beautiful at the same time. Um, it's not like reading Kant, right? Kant is the opposite uh, or, or some of these people where you're like, uh, like Joseph Campbell, read some Joseph Campbell, read like, you know, a chapter here, a thousand uh, faces and be like, what did I just read? What did they actually say? <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, and that's the opposite of what I'm trying to do. Flowery writing is not. Uh, poetic writing, rather, we should say, rather to, to not denigrate it. And you do want some poetic writing in your, um, your very more Orwellian um, uh, streamlined writing. But this is all kind of personal preference, right? Um, and character voice for me is king. Uh, is the character coming through? And any alterations to the style I'm generally doing through char for character voice reasons. You know, I just had a random thought uh, mm -hmm. come to mind, and I'm going to ask you this question because I can, and no one can stop me. Ooh, um, yes. I was thinking of the weirdest book I ever read, which was House of Leaves. Okay. I'm not, I'm not sure if you ever read that. I one. have not read that. Um, Flatland is probably the weirdest I've read. Okay. Um, I was going to ask you what, yeah. what the, the mm -hmm. weirdest book you ever read was. Uh, okay. Let's be honest, it's Finnegan's Wake, but I didn't finish Finnegan's mm -hmm. Wake, so I can't count that. So I did finish Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man. That might be weirder than Flatland. Uh, Flatland just has a weird concept, but it's written very easy to understand, where uh, Portrait of the Artist and Finnegan's Wake are written to be intentionally impenetrable. Mm -hmm. Anyway, go ahead. Okay. Go on. So, uh, can oh, you that, that was the that question. That was the question. Oh, what yeah. is it? What? So, yeah, like for a long time, I considered James Joyce kind of the opposite of what I was trying to do. Right, um, which uh, is like it, in my head that was like the 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 the, the opposites. Um, you have what the kind of Orwellian style that I'm shooting for, and you have uh, the the Joycean style, which is intentionally impenetrable. And how did he make it impenetrable? Stream of consciousness is part of it. Like that was what he developed uh, as part of Portrait of the Artist, a young man, and then led to Finnegan's Wake. As I understand, it's been a long time since my James Joyce classes, but it's also very deep literary illusions where, um, like, I get it, um, but. 
these are like the the Joycean literary illusions where you have to be like, oh, that's a reference to Paradise Lost, which means this character represents this character from Paradise Lost, which means this. Like that sort of stuff um, just doesn't generally work for me um, that well. It's one step away um, and kind of the same thing. It's just, you know, referencing a band being like, the reference itself being the cool thing. It's like you get to be in the in-group if you understand what Joyce is referencing here, but if you don't, then you just don't get the the whole idea and concept of it. Uh, just does not work for me um, very much. Um, that said, Pratchett did this too, and I love Pratchett uh, because, it, but it's never overt. Like, you know, if you don't know that, um, I mean, I'm gonna use a very, a very obvious example. Uh, he has a, there's a character in his book about rock music uh, call, whose name is Bud of the Holly, um, right? Like, um, that one's really obvious. There are a whole bunch of them like that that aren't. Um, you never don't get the theme of the story because you don't get the joke about the name that Terry Pratchett has put in. I like that. I love that. Because when you get one, it's hilarious. You're like, oh, you know, he, he's done this little thing, which is a cool kind of clever allusion to Shakespeare. Um, but when it feels like when Joyce does it, like if you don't get it, you just do not get the piece at all. Um, and you don't get why this character is doing this. Um, but uh, at the same time, I can acknowledge the brilliance of some of the stream of consciousness stuff he did. It was really revolutionary. And... There are sections of Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man that are just real interesting to read for that reason, uh, where it's like, I'm going to play with what the style of narrative, what it even means to have a different style. Of what, what is narrative anyway? Um, and that stuff. And Joyce did some really cool stuff with that. Um, so I don't want to just rag on James Joyce, um, but there are just certain parts of that style that, uh, that we hold up as very literary, where I'm like... Eh, this is just Ready Player One for people who love the classics, right? Mm -hmm. um, and Ready Player One, like, you know, nothing wrong with that, you know? But why, why is it when it's, it, it, it's you know, the Greek, uh, the, the Greek plays versus uh, Spielberg films is one of them enormous literature, literary masterpiece, and another one is, uh, is you know, yeah. So that, that's just, there you go. You can quote me. James Joyce. It's uh, inaccessible. No, no, no. It, James Joyce. It's Ready Player One for people oh. who love the classics. Um, but he obviously did a lot more than just those references. That's just one example. I mean, yeah. like I said, the textual stuff he did with uh, with some of the stream of consciousness is really cool and interesting. And uh, you know, I mean, he was all about theme. And if you want to study theme and understand theme, Joyce is great for kind of teaching you what it what we mean by theme when we talk about storytelling. And that stuff is really useful. It does enhance your narrative to have your theme reinforced through different aspects of your storytelling. And he was really good at that. So uh, we have a very patient watcher who's mm -hmm. asked several times for a question. Oh, okay. Uh, Kenny Valentine uh, says, "Do you have any advice on writing?" engaging training arcs without feeling too info dumpy uh they really love the training arc in skyward okay um so <clears throat> anytime your question is how do i do this without making it too info dumpy um and training arcs are a great example of this here are some rules of thumb number one character investment um make sure that your character is invested in what's happening through personal stakes and personal conflicts related to but surrounding the whatever thing it is. Training is uh, the example here, right? Like, don't let the reader, you can't let yourself do this because the reader will know. So don't let yourself be like, ah, we just have to get through this part so the fun stuff can happen. If you get that mindset in your head, um, then what's going to happen is it's going to be boring to the reader. Uh, you need to ask yourself, why is this sequence really important to my character? Not just because they need the skills. What other stuff is really important to this sequence for my character? Um, and then, of course, the, the rule of thumb number two when you're worried about info dumps is how do you construct your scenes in such a way to make it so you have to info dump the least and you can show on screen things happening the most? Um, can you construct a thing where instead of the magic being explained 
at length to the character. The character's in a situation where they just have to use it and muddle through it while they are figuring out the things that you are going to explain or someone is giving them tips. Um, and this sort of thing is just way better than, all right, here's how it works. Let's go down the list. Um, it's, it's the show versus tell. Show always t almost always takes more time, um, but it is more memorable and more interesting to read in the vast majority of cases. And so construct your scene around that sort of thing. And then ask yourself, last of all, like Brandon's big uh, thing I harp on a lot, what's your sense of progress? How do we know the character is getting better? What are they achieving? Um, what is, you know, how can you show this? Uh, and how can you use what the character is achieving to show off who the character is? What are your moments like Mulan, uh, you know, climbing, uh, uh, climbing the thing by using the weights, right? Um, what are your moments that, uh, that, that are really showing that the character is getting better? What are your moments when the character couldn't do this thing and now you show them able to do it and you show how that affects them and the people around them? Uh, make a, a solid sense of progress through a sequence and it's just eminently more engaging. Um, eminently? That's the wrong... Em, em, uh, it's not imminent. <laughs> but uh, it is... Ex uh, it is exceptionally more engaging. That's not even the right term either. It's just a lot more engaging. It's a, it's, it's, it's a better way to write. Uh, you can tell. I'm a writer because I, I, I use words good. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I know all the best words and I use them good. Um, so there you go. There, there's an answer to you. Perfect. Um, David Trottier or Trottier mm -hmm. says, can you tell us something innocuous about one of your main characters that won't necessarily make it to print because it doesn't affect the story like Tom's favorite color or meal or something? Uh, so this stuff um, people ask me for, and I usually jokingly uh, mention it, right? Like, you know, Hoyd's love of bacon and instant noodles um, and stuff like that. This is all jokingly because that sort of stuff, if I design it, I design it for a reason, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so the, one of my philosophies on both world building and character design is important pillars of who the character are that, from which you can extrapolate important and relevant things. And if it's not important or relevant, then you may not be able to extrapolate it, but it's not going to show up in the book that often, right? Um, like, you know, you can, you can talk about a character's favorite color if it is related to something in their life, but like what is Tallinn's favorite color? No idea, right? Um, like I could tell you right now, uh, but then that would be that would be like a very loose word of Brandon because if it ever became relevant, it would have to be something relevant to a character pillar of who they are, and it would most likely contradict whatever I would say right now, right? Um, and so you know, um, uh, so these sorts of things are actually really hard for me to uh, pop out because they are either they have to be a joke or they have to be something you could have just easily guessed because it is related to a core pillar of who the character is. And I wonder if this is uh, maybe coming down to a way a lot of people write where they create a dossier. Yeah, about yeah, the person. dossier. I think you said Dan Wells did that or yeah, something yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah. I don't dossier my character, which means I don't have a big list of all their likes and dislikes. Um, I instead use the, this pillar idea, right? Like, um, let's just... Take Kaladin. What are like the pillars of who Kaladin is? Kaladin, trained surgeon by his father, right? And the whole experience with his father is one of these pillars where he's a he's a trained surgeon, but he saw how people treated his father, um, and he resents that, um, and he um, he knows how to heal, but he found he's better at hurting. And this whole idea of Kaladin's training as a surgeon and the uh, experiences that he grew up with with that is like a pillar of who he is. Uh, what's another pillar of Kaladin? Pal Kaladin is big brother, right? Not big brother in the uh, 1984 sense, but in the, the, the sort of he is a big brother. He has a bit of, a, um, of, a, uh, of what you call a superhero complex where it's like I need to protect these people um, that plays in very well to his oaths and things, but he also has this idea of I have to be the one who takes care of these people. Um, I take care of my younger siblings. And that's just like a core pillar of, of who Kaladin is. Um, then you can add the, he really, really enjoys testing himself and fighting. This is the thing that he and um, Adolin bond over, right? They both have a core pillar that is this, I am really good at this 
physical prowess thing of uh, of of loving. In Calvin's case, he loves the spear. He loves practicing with it. He loves uh, being on the battlefield and testing himself in this way. Um, and then, you know, like final probably core pillar here is the, the idea of Kaladin's depression and how it influences and affects him and how it's uh, changed his childhood and these sorts of things. And so I build these things and I extrapolate personality, likes and dislikes, decisions they'll make in situations based on these pillars and how the pillars have changed for the character over time. I do not come up with a dossier of what is Kaladin's favorite color. Um, instead, I work on these these kind of foundational parts of who they are and what makes them do the things they do. Um, and that, um, I do this in my world building too. And that method of character design and uh, world building design makes it easy to answer questions to fans, but it also means that it's not like I'm getting something out of my notes and saying, oh, it's this. Um, and so it also means that as those pillars change and as those characters change, those answers change. Um, and so, yeah. It's a, it's a different way of seeing character from some of the ways um, that, uh, that people talk about it. But I actually think it is more common among writers. Um, they just don't really elucidate it as much. Um, that one is the right word, right? Um, and I, I think that it's very common for, for writers to do what I'm doing. They just, they don't teach writing as often as I do. And so therefore don't have to try to find ways to explain it. Um, Connor 44 from the chat mm -hmm. says, what makes you love a villain? What makes me love a villain? Um, a couple of things. Um, I really like like the classic things I talk about in my class, right? Proactivity um, and uh, relatability and uh, capability, right? The if, if a, a character like why do I what are, who are my favorite villains? Um, I would say my favorite villain is Magneto. Why do I like Magneto? Well, number one, capability. His powers are cool. He uses them in smart ways. It is. You know, while Wolverine is a lot of fun as a character, seeing Wolverine use his powers is just not that exciting, right? Seeing Magneto come up with some new way to use his powers is always exciting and fun. Um, there's only so many ways you can iterate on, I have claws and can't die, but I can manipulate metal. Hey, I, uh, you, you can see that I love that style of, uh, 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 of magic system quite a bit. Um, <laughs> What else? Well, <clears throat> he is the he is the protagonist of his story. He is he is causing things to happen. He has a goal. Um, he really works toward that goal, and he is very consistent in trying to make it happen. Uh, that's why uh, no spoilers, but uh, but uh, Zemo in um, the Falcon and the Winter Soldier was my favorite part of the entire show by like an order of magnitude. He was great uh really well written wonderfully acted and so great as a uh as a kind of anti-hero in that or whatnot villain that they were anyway he's just great um and it's this this proactivity and this kind of consistently trying to achieve something that is great and then finally it's the relatability what makes magneto the 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 best villain uh in my opinion is this fact that you're like i get it dude you, I totally understand you. You have the single most um, understandable backstory to current motives that probably exists in all of uh, comic books, right? Uh, as much as I like Thanos, which they did th a great job with Thanos, Magneto is just so much more. You're like, yeah, if I'm in your shoes, I'm doing what you're doing, bud. Um, I, I get it, um, you know? And it's... So therefore, heartbreaking, um, because the the authors who do him really well um, are you know humanizing him through that, through uh, Professor X's affection for him and their friendship and these sorts of things. It just works so well. So that's what makes me like a villain. Those three things uh, just kind of look at the best the best villains, and uh, I think that you find those three things in uh, Spades. Uh, Mario says. Uh, now that you're writing Wax and Wayne 4, mm -hmm. was it difficult to get back on track with the plot with the year since you wrote book three? And did you have to reread some parts of the previous books? So in this case, no, because um, basically this is an, a series that's still open in my brain. 
And so in those years, which I realized was six years, that was a long time, um, um, between books, um, that, that story has always opened my brain, basically, and some amount of my brain space since the last book has been dedicated to refining the next book, um, thinking about the characters, making small decisions about how the characters are going to progress and things like that. A, a book that is open in my brain, that is always happening. One of the reasons it's been so hard to get back to the Rhythmatist is I closed basically that book in my brain. There wasn't space in my brain for that series with The Wheel of Time, and so I closed that down, and I haven't been doing that for you know the last 10 years with that. But with Wax and Wayne, I have been. And Wax and Wayne, just right back into it, right? I could write the first chapter um, and just go. Now, what I won't necessarily get right are all of the little world building details, like how exactly did I decide on uh, writing um, Alik's accent, um, like stuff like that. Um, and that stuff I have to look back at. I have to go reread. All right, I had to go reread like the whole section um, where Alik first shows up and be like, all right, how did I do his accent? Let's make sure I'm consistent on that. All right, how do the grenade, alimantic grenade boxes work again? Uh, let me go back to my notes and make sure that I am not contradicting myself and how the physics of these things work. That sort of stuff I do, um, I do need reminders on. Um, it is, uh, it's, it's r rarely character or core narrative, um, at least on a book series that, like I said, I have kind of open in my brain. Uh, it's why I can always jump back into Stormlight very easily. Uh, it's because Stormlight has been open in my brain for since, uh, <laughs> since like 99. Um, and so, yeah. Uh, but I can only hold so many of those, right? Like basically at this point, I am, it, it's, uh, it's the mainline Cosmere books, um, and Warbreaker and Elantris, I would count in that, right? They're kind of open in my brain, um, but The Reckoners is not, right? Reckoners, I, you know, I, I closed that. I thought, when I finished it, I'm like, I know what I would do next, but I didn't have the brain space to just keep that open, and so I have handed that off, right? We're doing the co-authored book with uh, Stephen Bulls, um, and, um, and, you know, I'm I'm letting that one and Legion is the same way. Um, Alcatraz is the same way. As much as my son Dallin wants me to write another Alcatraz book, uh, book six is the is the end there. It's just finish things things off leaves me with more brain space for other things. But um, I doubt that there will be many more open series I can have right because right now Stormlight, Dragonsteel, um, uh, Mistborn, and to a lesser extent. Um, Warbreaker and Elantris um, and some of the other Shard Worlds um, are, are things that consume a lot of my, shall we say, RAM? Is that the right thing? Uh, right? Um, like, my working RAM. Like, Six of the Dusk is in there, right? First of the Sun, I suppose I should say. And, uh, and so is Threnody. Like, the Cosmere stuff takes a bunch of my brain. And... Um, there aren't a lot of things I can do. Like non-Cosmere, I basically have one open series in my brain right now, which is Skyward. And at the fourth book, I will close that one um, and, uh, and work on something else. So anyway, not hard for me to pick up on one of those things that I, that I have left open. Um, very hard to pick up on one that I have closed off. Uh, Maria says, if you were a Voran man, and had mm -hmm. to choose one of the women characters to take dictate uh, dictation of your novels, who would you want to work with? Uh, who would I want to work with um, to dictate my novels to? Oh, man. I don't know. Probably the most professional of them. Um, like, uh, like Brightness Call or somebody like this. Like somebody whose job is more around facilitating those things. Um, would probably who I would choose. Um, not who you were probably expecting, um, but, you know, um, somebody who that is what they pride themselves on. Um, like, you know, Shalon, I probably would not pick Shalon. She would be drawing pictures in the margins and be like, can you repeat that pair, that, that page? I'd be like, ah, it was a good page. I don't know if I can. Um, right? So, yeah, definitely, definitely not Shalon. Um, <laughs> Um, Jimmy Church says, I've been working on my third novel. 
I initially tried to write an antagonist who ends up being revealed as not a bad guy at the end. Okay. How active does the antagonist have to be? Um, so the antagonist, uh, it's in the name. They don't have to be, like, you don't have to have them necessarily driving the plot in the same way that you often see. Like, uh, Magneto and Joker are often pointed out as the good guys would never do anything if Magneto and Joker weren't, like, doing stuff. Right, that they had to respond to. That doesn't have to be how an antagonist works. Um, the antagonist can be an obstructionist, right? Like a great example of this uh, from cinema is Bruce Campbell when uh, Spider Man wants to go in and see uh, Mary Jane's uh, play that he's arrived late to, right? Bruce Campbell is not driving any of that story. It's just a little scene. If you don't remember it, he shows up and Bruce Campbell won't let him in, right? And it's it's fun because it's Bruce Campbell being Bruce Campbell and doing, you know, funny things with not letting him in. Um, but Bruce Campbell is not, like, driving that scene. Um, Peter Parker is. Uh, Peter Parker's trying to get in. He's actively... And Bruce Campbell's just a, a big old uh, closed door. Like, nope. Nope, you are not getting through here. Nope, sorry. And an antagonist can be that. What makes them an antagonist is that their what they want is cross purposes to the uh, protagonist, and that means that they can be doing things that are causing you know the protagonist uh, a lot of conflict and harm, or they can just be preventing. You know, they can just be in the way. And that works just fine as well, depending on the, the type of story you're writing and whatnot. Um, I mean, you know, person versus nature stories, the antagonist is nature itself. And they nature isn't deciding to do anything. It is just an enormous um, I impediment, right? Like, you know, when, uh, when you are trying to survive a ship sinking, um, the ship isn't actively trying to do anything to you. It is just an event that you are then characters are surviving and the characters then are taking a lot of the actions they are actively protagging it's just that the ship is sinking and to icy water and so you know you have to deal with that so uh you can you can view an antagonist that way and not have to try not everybody uh in, in not all great villains have to be magneto there are you know the ship who sinks in titanic you know the titanic itself is a pretty great antagonist um that you know, you do have a villain in that story as well, but uh, the ship sinking is the, the true antagonist. Uh, Aurora Jones says, and I'm going to mispronounce this name, did uh, Pygmalion from My Fair Lady give you inspiration for Wayne's character, asking since Wayne is an expert in phonetics? Oh, you know, I hadn't thought of that, but there is a little bit of that there. Um, My Fair Lady is actually a bigger influence on Vin than it is on Wayne. Um, just because, you know, the whole, uh, for very obvious reasons, uh, the Pygmalion story, uh, it, it, there's, there's a bit of them there. Sometimes when I pitch it to people, it's like My Fair Lady with Assassinations. Um, uh, but, um, but there's definitely some, you know, some, some of the, some of the linguistic stuff is very fun. Um, and I, I wouldn't be able to separate, uh, having seen My Fair Lady, uh, performed multiple times from how I designed Wayne. And, you know, he's he's often doing kind of an, an, an off-brand uh, Cockney. Um, and so, you know, that's it's part of that show too. So, yeah. Um, Mike V says, do you think there's a reason there seems to be a large number of fantasy sci-fi authors from the LDS church? Uh, so we get asked this a lot. Uh, we Everyone has their own philosophies on it. Um, I actually, I don't think, um, so, um, I think that there's a couple things going on here. One is we stand out more because it's incongruous, right? Uh, people do not expect a highly religious uh, culture in the United States to be one that is producing um, a lot of fantasy novelists because there's a certain anti-imagination, anti-fantasy movement among certain uh, religious movements in, uh, in the United States, shall we say. So it stands out to you when you're like, wait, He's a member of the, you know, he's LDS. That's odd. So it, it just, it highlights it to you. Um, but like uh, you find a lot of writers of all stripes among uh, members of the church. And it just, I think, is correlated to two things. One is Orson Scott Card. Uh, Orson Scott Card got big. Uh, Terry, um, 
Tracy, Tracy Hickman, uh, to a lesser extent. Um, and you know, like I remember being a kid and reading Dragonlance and reading that Tracy Hickman was a member of, uh, my same church and being like, Oh, maybe that's a job I can do. Like he did it. That's cool. Right. And so no, noting that like sets a seed in your brain. Um, that's like, this is a thing I could do. Um, and because of that, you see, you see more people in it. But um, I think the bigger influence is just the, the focus on literacy in the community, right? People who are members of our church, there's just a huge focus on literacy. There's a huge focus on, um, on going to college. And so you see actually writers of a lot of different stripes um, as members of the church. It's just the fantasy writers stand out because it seems so odd to people um, uh, because of, you know, things. But, I mean, there are... A lot of people who are Jewish who are involved in sci-fi fantasy and publishing in general and in, in books for, I think, some of the same reasons, right? Like um, they have friends and family who are members of the publishing industry, and so they become part of it. There's a huge focus on literacy. Because there's a huge focus on literacy in the community, you end up with more people writing stories um, and things like that. So um, I, that's my take on it. Uh, I don't think it's as odd uh, as, as, as you may think. It just stands out. Um, but I also do think that a few high-profile successes um, in the community led to other people um, like myself saying, oh, I, maybe I could do that too. And then uh, you, know, you end up with something like where you've got me teaching at uh, Brigham Young University, right? Where because I'm teaching there, um, students are taking my class and they are disproportionately members of the church. And so, and then some of them are publishing because they took my class and got a, a bit of a leg up because of that. And the fact that I sell well and Stephanie Meyer sells well, I think kind of perpetuates that where people are like, oh, this is something that I could actually do. Stephanie Meyer did it. Maybe I could do it. Brandon Sanderson did it. Maybe I can do it. So. Um, David uh, McAndrew wants to know if you've ever been to a Husker game. Uh, I have been to so many Husker games. I actually crave the hot dogs from Husker games. So Specifically? It's, yeah. That oh, yeah. Oh, oh okay. yeah. Just a taste of my childhood that nothing else quite tastes like um, are the hot dogs served in the, the, the Cornhusker Stadium. Like, I don't even know if they're the same because it's been a long time since I went. But one does not simply live in Nebraska <laughs> without experiencing Cornhusker fandom um, on a level that is difficult to understand for people who do not live in um, smaller s cities with s states with lower populations and no professional sports teams and not a lot of other entertainment options. Uh, how shall we, shall we say, right? Um, like I came and I, I get you. I know you guys are going to be mad at me, but I get you BYU fans. I understand that you're fans of, of Brigham Young University. Um, I get that, you know, that you, you, you are very sincere in your fandom. It's a different level in Nebraska. We have, there's no professional sports teams. There aren't multiple colleges with teams, right? Um, there is, uh, there is one. There is, there are the Cornhuskers. And, you know, my, um, before game day, um, our principal at my, at my grade school would dress up as Herbie Husker in a giant costume with a giant foam hat. The principal, right? And the city shuts down on game day and it, every, every um, store you would go in, if you can get to a store because, you know, so much of the city is shut down, um, every store you go into has the game on, right? That's just... That's just how it is. If you walked into a store and it was not playing the game over the, the speakers in the store, it would be really odd. You're like, I can't shop here. I can't, I can't track the game. If uh, I can't, you know, we had to run out for milk. I've got to find out what's going, like everywhere. At least when I was growing up, that was just the way it is. Maybe the internet has changed things. So everyone has their phone so they can track. But back then, you know, you're like, everywhere you went, you were, you were at the Huskers game wherever you were, even if you didn't want to be. Yeah, uh, someone from Facebook said, good luck finding a red shirt in Nebraska that's not associated yeah. with the college. Yeah, 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 yeah. And on, on like game day, like the entire city is red. Everything is red. Everybody's wearing red. You, you're, if you're driving around, you are passing seas of red. Um, it is, uh, 
<laughs> and uh, from Twitch, the yeah. hot says the Huskers are a cult. <laughs> yes, the, the, I mean the the and you got to remember, I grew up during um right the the years where Huskers won a lot. They haven't been doing as good. Uh, you know, they but they had that that uh, '90s run that was kind of like the Chicago Bulls uh, in basketball, where it's just like, you know what, the Huskers were the top of their field, and that infuses things and changes things even more. And so, yeah, um, those days, uh, you know, the the Osborne Devaney days um, in uh, in Nebraska were 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 another thing entirely to anywhere I've been for any sort of sports fandom. Um, so, um, Sean Dick says, would you rather have a movie adaptation be faithful and loved by fans, uh. but not very successful or not at all be faithful, disliked by book fans, but massively successful? I would pick the first, um, though it is a harder decision. I've actually thought about this one than you might think. Um, because it, it's going to depend, like, um, I think that the best adaptations, um, tend to be ones that are not as faithful as some of the faithful adaptations, right? Like my perfect adaptation is one that is faithful to the idea and soul of the story, but may not include, um, many of the exact same scenes. Um, but I would hope that that sort of thing would be loved by the fans. And it depends on who you're talking about with the fans. Like, I know a lot of people who do not like the Lord of the Rings films um, because, you know, the cutting out Tom Bombadil and cutting out the Scouring the Shire and tweaks to Aragorn's character and some of these things, right? Um, I love the Lord of the Rings films in part because of those tweaks making them better films. Uh, I think they're just absolute masterpieces. And so it depends on, like, who you mean by fans. It, it, um, if I, yeah, um, yeah, I, I, if I, if, if those were my only two options, I would pick the, the one that was not commercially sex, uh, successful, but was, um, was beloved by fans. Cause I think even over time that one becomes more of a force, um, than, than the other one. And I'm trying to think of any adaptations that were beloved by fans that were not successful, at least over time. Are, are there any, right? Like, I'm trying to think of like, the problem is usually that it's hated by fans and it's not successful, right? right. Like, I can't think of like, I suppose Starship Trooper is like the quintessential example of if you are a fan of the book Starship Troopers, you are probably not going to like the movie. Um, and right? vice versa, probably. And vice versa, right? Um, but... Most people who are fans of the books and don't like the movies, it's because it's a bad movie, right? It's not, Starship Troopers happens to be a good movie, which is a total and utter renunciation and disavowal and undermining of the book. Um, to a lesser extent, there's iRobot, right? Uh, the Will Smith iRobot, um, which is a good movie, um, without being an excellent movie, but a good movie that is not very Asimov-y, but it doesn't completely undermine Asimov's ideas. Uh, it just thematically undermines Asimov's ideas, if that makes sense. Um, and so that might be another example of a successful one that it, as a fan of Asimov, I, I wish we had an actual adaptation um, that was good, um, but also faithful because Bicentennial Man was faithful, but it's not a great movie. Uh, Rob Williams is, is good, but it's not a great movie. And iRobot is a good movie, but it's not a very good adaptation of anything having to do with Asimov's actual philosophy. So Yeah, someone in the chat, I just missed their name, but they said Jurassic Park. Jurassic and Park? No, that not... doesn't count because Crichton loved Jurassic Park. He was involved in Jurassic Park, right? Yeah, but I'm uh, specifically talking about the the translation between the two mediums because it was pretty close but it I mean, was pretty was close obviously changes. i mean you know they uh like ian malcolm lives in one and dies in the other and um the uh the th it's less a horror the book is more horror um but i don't know that that's a th like i think Crichton liked that adaptation and as a fan of the book i think it's a fantastic adaptation um is sean deb says the shining 
Oh, the Shining. A there's a, that's there's the quintessential example. Good job. Uh, would would I pick to have the Shining? Uh, yes. It, like if um, if my book inspires a filmmaker on the caliber of Stanley Kubrick to make a film on the caliber of The Shining, and it isn't a strict adaptation, like I would be happy. But that's a difference between me um, and you know so, um, other writers, which I respect. Those other writers, like Stephen King, not liking The Shining, I can totally get. I'm I'm behind him saying no. It isn't. Someone went off and made their own thing, but. It's The Shining. It's so good. Uh, so uh, that's, but that's a good example. Could I, if I were going to choose The Shining, I probably would choose. But that's a difference in my philosophy, right? Like I would be there writing the screenplay with them, right? I would be involved, heavily involved in that, and I would be, um, I would be okaying that. Like it's, so it's a different experience. If I'm going to like not be involved, I probably wouldn't pick to have The Shining because I wouldn't trust that it turns out um, the way that. Uh, that that movie did. How about that? So there you go. Uh, good question. What a great question. So we are out of time. Um, mostly I need to go get some dinner and let everybody else here get some dinner. Uh, thanks for hanging out with us. Uh, we'll be back uh, first week of June, and I might be able to confirm for you that some of those leather bands are going out if uh, when we do. Yeah, and I know we had talked about doing a spoiler stream. Yes. Are and we that... going to make that be June? Yeah, let's make that June. So okay. next next stream is spoiler. Are we uh, doing Mistborn or uh, just no. Let's just spoiler. do general Cosmere spoilers. Okay. Uh, actually, let's just do spoilers for anything so that they can ask Skyward stuff too okay. if they want. Okay, cool. Um, so spoilers. Open spoiler stream. Open spoiler stream. Um, will be our June stream. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, otherwise, uh, thank you guys so much. And you take care. And I'm actually going to record my weekly update right now, but not in front of you all. So uh, <laughs> we'll cut it out and uh, you can watch that on Monday. But I basically just gave it to you. <laughs>